Hi, I'm George. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm here in the region of Crystal Palace in South London and I'm just on my way to the Spectrum Figurative Art School which is my friend Charlie Pickard's art school and I'm going to be painting a portrait and perhaps a bit of the figure as well. But let's start painting. The model I'm painting today is Christina and she's wearing this nice white summery dress and I've decided I want to paint in some of this as well as her portrait. I start the painting with an under sketch using thin down raw umber paint. First I mark the top and bottom of her head and then I paint the overall shape using simplified straight lines. It's important that you carefully consider the placement of the model onto your canvas at this early stage as you need to make sure that there will be enough room to fit in everything that you want to paint onto your canvas as there's nothing more annoying than painting some nicely rendered details and then realizing that you have to move everything over or you're going to run out of space and for this reason I've placed the head higher up on my panel to leave space to paint in some of Christina's dress and her contraposto gesture. When painting the shoulders, it's useful to check the width of the shoulders in comparison to the size of the head, as getting this relationship wrong could make your sitter look like a professional rugby player, or if painted too narrow, it could give the impression that the model has a massive head. So in general, if you paint an adult female, the widest point of the shoulders is equal to two times the width of the head. However, I find it still helpful to compare these relationships by holding my paintbrush up to the model from my viewpoint with one eye shut and using my thumb to measure the distance from the end of the paintbrush to the point that I'm measuring. Keeping my thumb in the same place, I can hold my paintbrush over my painting and compare the proportional relationships. When painting figures or portraits where the chest is visible, the pit of the neck, also known as the jugular notch, is a very important point to mark and use as a reference for the proportions and the gesture of the head. I often compare the distance from the bottom of the chin to the pit of the neck against the length of the head, as this helps me paint the neck at the right length. The pit of the neck is also a useful point when sketching in the collarbones and the shoulders. Now that I've sketched the overall proportions, I've started to fill in the shadow shapes using the same thinned down raw umber paint. In this way, I'm marking the features with minimal detail, focusing mainly on the correct positioning, creating a monochromatic impression of the big shapes of light and dark. I find it helpful to avoid jumping into small details early on, as without the big shapes placed correctly, you run the risk of wasting a lot of time by rendering a feature which might need to be moved. At this stage of the painting, to correct any drawing mistakes, I can simply dip my tissue into some of my medium and then just wipe out the lines I need to remove, similar to the way you'd use a rubber in a drawing. Here I'm re-establishing the contours of the shadow shapes and darker accents within them. I'm now keying in the darkest darks, which in this case are found in Christina's hair. I'm using a colour mix of raw umber, alizarin crimson and ultramarine blue to create a very deep and rich dark value. I'm focusing on painting the overall shape of the hair rather than trying to paint individual strands of hair. I find it helpful to squint at your model to simplify the value shapes as squinting does away with the small details which can act as distractions at this stage of the painting.
using a colour mix of alizarin and crimson, raw umber, cadmium yellow, and a very small touch of permanent green and titanium white, I'm now filling in the shadow pattern on the face by painting over my raw umber undersketch. Using the same colour mix, I continue to fill in the shadow pattern on the left hand side of the figure on her neck and shoulder. On my palette, I'm now mixing a few different colour mixes for the flesh tones. So I've already mixed the shadow mix for the flesh and the mix for the darkest darks in the hair. Here I'm mixing the light flesh tone using titanium white, cadmium red, permanent green and cadmium yellow. So here I'm mixing a half tone colour that will sit between the shadow value and the light flesh tone in order to turn the form and give the head and figure a three dimensional appearance. This mix is a bit cooler in colour temperature than the light flesh tone and the shadow tone as I've added a bit more permanent green to it and less cadmium red. Here I'm mixing a warmer flesh tone for Christina's cheeks and nose. In this colour mix I'm using titanium white and a bit of the other flesh tone mix that I've made, but also a bit more cadmium red, cadmium yellow and a touch of alizarin crimson to give this paint mix a pinker hue. And here I'm just painting those cool half tones next to the shadow shapes. I'm now painting in the mid-tones of the face, which are lighter and warmer than the half-tones, but still not as light as the highlights, which I will paint on top later. Now I'm painting a warmer flesh tone for the cheeks and the nose, which are typically the reddest areas of the face, other than the lips. Also notice how although these mid-tones are similar in tonal value, there are noticeable shifts in hue for the different sections of the face, with the forehead being a bit more yellow and the cheeks and nose being a bit more pink. Here I'm painting the dark accents for Christina's upper eyelashes. When painting the eyes, it's important to keep checking that they are positioned correctly in relation to each other and the tilt of the head. As painting the eyes out of line is one of the most common mistakes that people and even experienced artists make when painting portraits. As I paint the colours on the face, I'm applying the paint mainly using filbert brushes as the rounded corners of this brush give the paint strokes a soft and diffuse edge rather than the hard, sharp edge that flat brushes might make. Also the broadness of the filbert brush allows for the paint to cover a larger area than a round, pointed brush would. And at the same time, this fine point at the end of the filbert brush still allows me to create those fine lines when the brush strokes are applied in line with the thinnest part of the brush. Once the main planes of the face have been massed in, I start to refine the transitional edges between the tones. The softness or sharpness of these transitions help to convey the surface texture, as well as the nature of the shadows, be they form shadows, which turn away from the light with the form, or cast shadows, which are shadows that are cast by the shape of an object which is blocking the light and typically have sharper edges than form shadows.
As I paint, I'm also holding back on painting the eyebrows, as I want to paint the orbital structure which they sit on top of first. Here I'm layering over the hair, as my initial layer was applied very thinly, and as a result, the light value of the panel is shining through the translucent paint, making it look lighter. And I'm also redefining the contours as I re-establish the darkness in the hair. I'm now painting the eyebrows over the top of the orbital structure, using the same dark mix that I used to paint the hair. However, I'm thinning it down slightly with my medium and applying it with delicate brush strokes, allowing for the hairs of the brush to lightly touch the painting surface, creating the effect of the eyebrows' fine hairs and avoiding painting them as solid lines which would look unnatural. To paint the lips, I start by painting the upper lip, which is darker as it's facing down away from the light, and therefore in shadow. The bottom lip is facing upwards towards the light, and is therefore lighter in tonal value. The lips also sit on a cylindrical structure of the lower face, made up of the maxilla and the mandible, so therefore, as the lips curve away from the light, they get darker in the corners especially on the left hand side, which is furthest from the light. I'm now massing in the flesh tone of Christina's neck, shoulders and chest using a large filbert brush. So this is the second day of working on this painting and it's been one week since I touched it so the paint is now dry to the touch. And some of the darks have sunken in a little bit and lost some of their impact. So here I'm oiling out the painting. 
which basically involves dipping a clean paintbrush into my medium, which on the first day had been about 80% sansador, which is a low odor solvent, to 20% refined linseed oil. But I've actually added a bit more oil to this medium, so now it's more like 60% sansador to 40% refined linseed oil. And then I'm painting this medium over the surface so that the darks and the saturation in the colors come back to life. And it's important that you dab your painting after you've applied your medium with a kitchen towel or a clean lint-free rag to remove any excess oil which could drip down your painting. I'm now adding some highlights to Christina's chest, instantly bringing out the form and preventing this area from looking flat and two-dimensional. When painting the highlights on a figure, I never use pure white, but rather just a slightly lighter color mix than the main flesh tone color mix. If you paint the highlights too light, this will give the skin a shiny or wet appearance, or even worse, just look like they have some white paint on their skin. Here I'm painting in the background. I'm keeping the color and value similar to that of the imprimatura of the panel which is a light neutral gray. However, I'm creating a soft vignette by gradually darkening the paint as it gets further from the center. Also, instead of painting the background with just one color mix of neutral gray paint, I'm actually using a technique made popular by the French impressionists known as broken color, where I'm using small dabs of a relatively distinct color placed next to another color so that from a distance, the colors will mix optically. Here I'm using a grayed down yellow, and next to this I'm painting its complementary color, which is basically whichever color sits on the opposite side of the color wheel, so in this case, a grayed down purple. And by doing this, I add a bit more vibrancy to the background, while still creating the appearance of a slightly warm, light gray from a distance. One of the fun things about painting white clothing is the subtleties and hue shifts that you get within the shadows. For example, in the folds, there are some warm golden colors where light is being reflected in, either from bouncing off the floor or other sections of the white dress. These warm hues contrast nicely against the cool bluish purple in the core shadows on the folds.
Here I'm adding a few finishing touches to the hair, and as the background paint is wet, I can drag some of these brush strokes for the hair into the background, allowing the paint to mix, creating a soft appearance, and lightening the hair in these areas, giving it its natural translucency. Now I'm adding and refining some of these cast shadows on Christina's neck caused by these locks of hair. I finished my painting of Christina here at my friend Charlie Pickard's art studio. He's over there, still working on his painting. And if you enjoyed that video, please do give me a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. And I'll see you in the next video.